Hey everybody, it's Lon Seidman and we've got one more Ryzen-based laptop to look at this week. Today we're reviewing the Dell Inspiron 5575. It's a Ryzen-based device. It's got the R52500U and like the others we've looked at, it's got a 15-inch 1080p display and we're going to put it through its paces very shortly and compare it to the other two we looked at earlier this week. But I do want to let you know in the interest of full disclosure that I paid for this with my own funds. All the opinions you're about to hear are my own. Nobody is paying for this review, nor has anyone reviewed or approved what you're about to see before it was uploaded. So let's get into it now and see what this laptop is all about. So let's take a closer look now at the hardware. The price point on this one is just a little over $400, which does put it in line with the Asus and Lenovo machines we looked at a little earlier in the week, powered by the same AMD processors. What's unique about this one, though, is that it has a touch display, a 10-point touch display to be exact, so you can touch the screen and move things around. I was pleased with how well balanced it is and how strong the hinge is here. So as I'm pushing into the screen, uh, it's not giving way. It's actually pulling the keyboard up here, but you can really uh, work on this screen here without having things move around all that much. The display doesn't move that far though. That's about as far as it goes, but the hinge feels really good on this, nice and tight, which is a good thing. Uh, the quality of the display though isn't great. It is an IPS display, so when you're looking at it uh, head on, it's nice and sharp. But because of that touch layer, the image kind of drops off when you're looking at it uh, from different angles. It is brighter than the displays we saw on the Asus and Lenovo, but it's also a bit more washed out and the images are slightly colder and that it's got more of a blue tint to it. So the quality of this display is not as good as the other two, but if you're looking for a touch display, you'll have it here, complete with very large bezels. Uh, so again, it's just a matter of what you're looking for in your laptop. Inside, we've got eight gigabytes of RAM. Uh, the good news is, is that this is configured in dual channel configuration, so it will make use of that processor's graphical performance to its fullest ability. Uh, it also has a one terabyte mechanical spinning drive inside. Uh, which makes it feel a little slower than the other two just because things are taking longer to load due to the speed of that drive. It won't affect the benchmark scores you'll see in a few minutes, but you will be waiting for applications to load up. The good news though is that you can upgrade this one, and this is actually the most upgradable of the three that we have looked at this week. Uh, so you can swap out the spinning drive and put in a solid state SATA drive. There's also an open NVMe slot for an NVMe SSD, so you could definitely speed it up with that. Uh, the RAM here is also configured with two sockets, uh, so you can pull out the two sticks of RAM. Right now there are two sticks of four in here. You could put in two sticks of eight and go to 16 gigabytes and maintain your dual channel memory. Uh, the other machines that we've looked at this week have four gigabytes soldered on with another four gigs socketed, but there is a significant limitation with this particular laptop, which is how much video RAM is available for that AMD processor. Check it out. Only 256 megabytes are available for the system to use, and there is no way to change this at the time I'm recording this video. They could easily add a BIO setting or something to allow the user to do that, but they purposely limited the RAM here, which as you'll see in a few minutes is going to dramatically impact its gaming performance and pretty much mitigate all of the benefits you'll get with a Ryzen processor. So if your intent was to get something to play games, as you'll see, this is not gonna be the laptop for you. Now the weight on this one is 4.62 pounds or 2.1 kilograms. When you're in budget territory for a laptop, you give up portability and battery life. And of course, this one gives up those things as well. Battery life is maybe five or six hours doing basic tasks. If you start straining the processor with video editing and photo editing and that sort of thing, expect even less battery life than that. So keep that power adapter nearby. Uh, but this is in line with what we saw out of the other two uh, Ryzen laptops we have looked at. Uh, but it's not all bad. The keyboard's pretty decent. It's backlit. Uh, keys are a little on the smaller side, but they're very well spaced apart. This is a design that Dell has used on their other laptops, including the more expensive ones. So no issue for me with the keyboard, at least. Uh, nice travel on those keys, too. You get the full number pad here as well. Decent trackpad, not any better or worse than what I've seen on other similarly priced laptops. It works, and I think you'll have a good run with it. 
Uh, this one's got a bunch of ports, so you do have your HDMI output here. Uh, this is a uh, HDMI 1.3 output, so you're not going to get any high-end 4K stuff going out of it. Uh, you do have an Ethernet jack here, which is always good to see on a laptop, but it's only 100 megabit, and I had to really dig around in the specs to find out what the speed of this port was. They just called it an RJ45, which is true, but they didn't indicate the speed. It is only 100 megabit. But you do get two USB 3.0 ports here along with a headphone jack. On the other side, we have an SD card reader for uh, the larger SD cards, but the cards will stick out of it. They don't go all the way in. Uh, then you've got a USB 2.0 port, which will be a little slower than the two on the other side. So if you have hard drives that you're plugging in, make sure they go over there and not here. This is better for a mouse and keyboard and that sort of thing. And then you've got your Kensington lock here for locking it down on the, on the desk. Uh, the speakers are downward firing. Decent volume to them, but not great. Uh, you do get some stereo separation, but I think if you want better quality audio, uh, use some Bluetooth headphones, which this supports, or uh, plug in something to that headphone jack because the audio quality out of the speakers is not spectacular. So that is the overall hardware. So let's move on now to performance. We loaded up my YouTube channel and we had our 1080p 60 video running. Uh, no drop frames, no issue with playback. So like the other machines we've looked at this week, this one should be fine for media consumption. Uh, we also took a look at the nasa.gov homepage. It took a little bit for the page to render on our first visit, but after that, things improved. And I think that sluggishness was due to the fact that we have that spinning mechanical hard drive in here that is not as fast as the SSDs you'll find on the other laptops we have looked at. So that's an area where you'll see some performance differences. But we did run the browserbench.org speedometer test, which is looking more at its processing capabilities. Uh, and there we got a score of 105 on version 1.0 of that test and 62.9 on version 2.0. And that was very competitive with what we saw on the other Ryzen-based machines that we have tested this week. In fact, it was a little bit better than those were on that test. So I think if you had a solid state drive on here, you wouldn't see any real performance differences with the others we have already tested. So let's move on now to gaming. And this is where you're going to see the video memory issue rear its head. Uh, so Fortnite is running here at 1080p low settings, 40 to 60 frames per second, which isn't bad, but we were having significant rendering issues. Uh, so trees were not showing their tree trunks. We're getting a lot of floating green shapes in the sky, a lot of other issues with various objects throughout the game. And again, I think that's due to the limited video memory that's available on this machine. Uh, next, we loaded up GTA 5. Uh, we ran it at 1080p at its lowest settings like we did on the other two AMD devices this week. There we only got frame rates between 15 and 25 frames per second with a lot of spiky lag issues going on, uh, which really diminished any kind of playability. So this was just not doing well here on the games at all. Uh, Rocket League ran uh, a bit oddly as well. At the lowest settings, 1080p, we were getting decent frame rates between 55 and 85 frames per second, but I think there's some thermal throttling going on here that is making it not run as consistently as it did on the other two machines. Uh, two other games we tested out was The Witcher 3, 720p, lowest settings, about 18 to 25 frames per second, close to what we got on the other ones, but still dipping a bit lower than those did. And then the new version of Doom at, at 720p, 8 to 20 frames per second. Again, just not consistent performance, which is what we did get out of the other two Ryzen-based machines this week. Now, we also ran the 3D Mark CloudGate benchmark test, and there we got the lowest score of the three at 9,371. Graphically, it was able to keep up with the other two, but the CPU test, as you can see here, is much lower. And we ran the test multiple times just to make sure something wasn't running in the background or something, and that was what we were getting just about every time. And if we look at the 3D Mark stress test, you can see our score there is 68.5%. This measures how well the computer does under sustained load by running one of these benchmarks over and over again. Passing is 97%, so you can see there's probably some significant throttling going on here, uh, which was very evident in the games we were playing. So this is definitely not going to be the machine for gamers, but if you want that touchscreen and the backlit keyboard for the price point, it might be okay for that. 
uh, but overall, not the best one of the bunch here by far. Now, oddly, the fan noise on this one is the loudest of the three we've looked at this week, yet it's not able to get rid of the hot air as well as the other competing devices do. And as such, this feels a bit warmer to the touch when you're using it versus the Asus and the Lenovo. But it does run Linux, and as we saw earlier in the week, the Lenovo could not run Linux, and the Asus could. Uh, this one seems to be doing Linux as well as the Asus did, uh, so that's good. We've got Ubuntu running here. It was able to detect video, audio, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, uh, all of the things that we look for are working here, including the touch display. So I think Linux will be a good experience, and this might be a low-cost way to get yourself a little Linux machine you can play around with. So that's good, but on the whole here, uh, this is probably not one I'm going to recommend. Uh, it's got some thermal issues, but it also has that shared video memory issue. And to not give the user the choice to expand that available video memory was a big mistake on this one. Perhaps they could change that down the road with a BIOS update, but this one's been out for a while and they haven't done it. So it's really kind of crippled from that standpoint which is unfortunate because this uh, Radeon uh, architecture inside of the AMD Ryzen processor can do so much better than what this one is delivering at the moment because its memory is really, really limited. And that is going to mean that this one isn't making the cut for me. Uh, so that's going to do it for this week's reviews of Ryzen laptops. We are going to come back with one more video on this topic uh, where we're going to take the Lenovo, which was the best performing and lowest cost of the three, and run some video editing applications on it, Adobe Premiere Pro, Photoshop, we're gonna look at OBS, and we'll run some game emulators on it too, just to get a feel as to what you can do with the lowest cost Ryzen machine as a baseline. And I think you'll be surprised what these machines can do. And if you're in the market, this is the one I would recommend you don't get, uh, but some of the others do have a lot of promise. And we're going to try to look at as many of these as we can because they all have unique attributes uh, so if you are finding some Ryzen machines that are under $500, let me know down in the comment section, and I'll try to get more in as the year progresses here. And that's going to do it for now. Until next time, this is Lon Sybin. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by the Lon.TV supporters, including Gold Level supporters, the Four Guys with Quarters podcast, Tom Albrecht, Rajesh, Logic GR and Kalyan Kumar. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.